Being a Rotarian is now even more rewarding. Rotary Global Rewards, our member benefit program, offers amazing ways to save. So Rotarians get more out of life and do what they do best. Give back. The good you do comes back to you. Rotary Global Rewards. Find out more at rotary.org slash myrotary. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Tulsa, where a bunch of good people come together and do great things around the community. First of all, I'd like to give a big round of applause to our Tulsa Symphony Ensemble this morning. We'll hear a little bit more about them later, and that's Dr. David Carter and Angela Carter. And how long have you all been making beautiful music together? They're husband and wife. <laughs> Let's take a quick moment and greet each other, especially the round red badges. We have a fascinating speaker today, so let's go ahead and get started. For our invocation this morning, uh, Norm Simon. Song and Pledge is by Corey Nickerson, and Visitor Introductions is by Chuck Wilson. If I could have Norm now for our invocation. Please bow your heads. Dear God, hear our voice. Grant us the strength and courage as we seek to serve mankind to strengthen our foundation of international goodwill. Continually remind us that we are here for the betterment of our fellow man. Help us all to work to be successful in our obligations and our responsibility to Rotary. We pray that we are ever mindful of opportunities to render our service to fellow citizens and to our community. Help us keep in mind the enduring values of life, those things upon which future generations can build. Let us continue to strive to make a better world. Amen. Let's sing America. Now, for those of you who don't know which one that is, it's the one that goes, my country, tis of thee. <laughs> my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, uncut, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon. It is my privilege to introduce our visitors and our visiting Rotarians. So we'll take our visitors first. If you and your host Rotarian will please stand when I call your names for just a few moments. Moaine Bradshaw is the husband of Linda Bradshaw. Teddy Andrus is the fiance of our Rotarian of the day, Sydney Marcellus. Peter Jansen is with U.S. Sign. Barney James is his host. And President John has brought from IMAX Christina Spurlock. Anna Rainey 
is a guest of our speaker today, and she is with Polston Tax. Jared Bell is my guest today. Jared. Justin Jones of Wycliffe Bible is with David Wagner. Lupe Latimer Jerry Bur is with Jerry Barrientos, and they are with First Mate. And a special guest is Lane Dolly, who is with Michelle Place, and Lane is the niece of the late, great Dr. Harold Calhoun. We're so glad to have you here. Let's welcome our guest. <laughs> Visiting Rotarians, a, a very familiar person to us, Eric Ortega, now with Southside, say hello to Eric. And from Sand Springs is Harlan Pinkerton. Now for the award for the person traveling the furthest to be with us today, from the Chicagoland Lithuanians Rotary Club, got it? Dr. Vesta V, and she is uh, with the judge back here. Say hi to Vesta. Thanks to all of our guests. You're so welcome, and, and please come again. Thank you, Chuck. I'd like to thank our sponsors this morning. We have two, or six, if you want to say it that way. Paul Bauman, Monty Curry, Gordon Greer, and Bill Miller are with Bank First. And David Wolfers is with James Potts and Wolfers. Let's give them a big hand. We have some upcoming programs, going to give you a little information on it. April the 5th, Denise Reed with Mosaic and Workforce Tulsa is going to join us. On April the 12th is our annual Oklahoma City Exchange, semi-annual, it's in Tulsa. So we're going to hear from Mayor Mick Cornett on April the 12th. And on April the 19th, we have a panel program, and it's going to be on inclusion with Gatesway, New View, the Center, and One Gas. So help us, uh, be sure and invite your guests and help us welcome everybody as uh, they join us to be a speaker. So I would now like to invite Hillary O'Toole forward. Hillary has been a member of the Wild Music Institute since 2012. She traveled from New York City to be with us today. She's a manager of learning and engagement and has implemented the Link Up program in New York City and expanded it nationally and internationally. Currently, the program provides concert and educational services to over 390,000 students and teachers. Hillary. Good afternoon. Thank you for that lovely introduction. My name is Hillary O'Toole, and I am the manager of learning and engagement at Carnegie Hall's Weill Music Institute. And this is my first visit to Tulsa. I'm really excited to be here as a guest of the Tulsa Symphony Orchestra for a very special event they are planning for tomorrow evening called Link Together. I'm happy to have a few minutes today to tell you a little bit about the Link Up program and its expanding impact on students here in Tulsa. Curious, how many of you have memories of playing a plastic flute-like instrument called the recorder when you were in elementary school. <laughs> Just like those of you who raised your hands, I too played in third and fourth grade. And for many of us, it is just the first of many instruments we will learn to love and play through our lives. But for, for many of us, I'm sure it was also your last. <laughs> but for, for others, it opens the door for a lifetime of music study and appreciation and introduces us to a worldwide community of, of people who understand music's common language. Little did I know when I was younger uh, the serious presence that that instrument would take on my future career path. I now manage Carnegie Hall's largest and longest running education initiative, LinkUp. We now partner with 93 orchestras worldwide where hundreds of hundreds and sometimes thousands of students come to a concert hall with their soprano recorders and play along with the orchestra. And for that to be successful, it takes a lot of practice, 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 as we say at Carnegie Hall. 
LinkUp has been presented in one form or another for more than 30 years. It's just one of many programs developed by the Weill Music Institute, and it helps to address a need in the field for high quality, accessible music education resources and programming by providing free curriculum resources that classroom teachers can implement along with their students in their classrooms, including teacher and student guides, video and audio online resources, and the professional development that helps to support the teachers to make this program an engaging and um, instructive experience for the students. The program's goals are primarily to teach fundamental music skills to students in grades three through five, including creative work and composition. We also aim to introduce students to the symphony orchestra, inspiring the next generation of musicians and orchestral music lovers. We hope to foster the relationships between the symphony orchestra and their local schools, strengthening the international music education community, and to also provide professional development opportunities for teachers and teaching artists, building capacity for educators and organizations. Whether or not you have an elementary school student in your life, you should know about the work that Tulsa Symphony is doing to bring the LinkUp program to your community. It is far more than just a typical youth concert. As I mentioned, those students have recorders in hand. It actually brings them into the music making process by having them learn to perform and understand music from standard orchestral repertoire. Their teachers participate in annual professional development sessions that are led by the Tulsa Symphony staff, musicians, and leading local educators. They uh, attend these sessions to learn how to adapt the program into their existing in-school curriculum. A different program is presented annually. We now have four different concert options that our orchestra partners can select, from the orchestra moves, the orchestra sings, the orchestra rocks, and we're developing a new one as we speak, called the orchestra swings. And with these four different programs, as students progress through different grade levels, they never repeat the same program and are continuously challenged to comprehend different aspects of musical structure. After months of in-school preparation, students and teachers attend a live Tulsa Symphony Orchestra concert where they perform that music they've studied right alongside the orchestra from their seats in the concert hall as part of a fully scripted, visually engaging concert. Tulsa Symphony became a link-up partner in the 2015-16 season and in short time has done remarkable work building upon their relationships with multiple school districts. Since piloting the program with 1,200 students and teachers last year, Tulsa's Symphony's LinkUp program has grown by an unbelievable 900%. This year, Tulsa Symphony reached more than 12,000 students and teachers through LinkUp, integrating the program into every elementary school in Tulsa, Union, Sand Springs, Jenks, and Broken Arrow Public Schools. Through our teacher surveys, we've learned that uh, we've gotten some great feedback from Tulsa area teachers who've expressed their excitement about the program in their community. As part of the partnership, Carnegie Hall, we are, develop we are committed to providing each orchestra with curriculum resources for every single participating teacher and student, uh, concert score and orchestra parts for the orchestra, and also a, a full concert script and visuals that are projected um, up above the orchestra at that culminating concert. We also provide additional support from my team at Carnegie Hall on all aspects of implementing the program in their community. Each partner orchestra is responsible for managing the program locally and for producing their culminating concert, of which Tulsa Symphony produced nine this year. The program is presented at zero cost to schools, teachers, or parents, and the expense assumed by the Tulsa Symphony breaks down to less than $12 per child. With the Link Together event tomorrow at the Cox Center, Tulsa Symphony is bringing the community together to showcase the program and to recognize contributions of teachers and their dedication to Tulsa area schools and students. 
Tulsa Symphony hopes to expand their reach to even more schools next year. And tomorrow's Link Together event will, be, will benefit the program for the 17-18 school year. You can speak to Tulsa Symphony uh, musicians and members after today's meeting. You can also visit their website or, or Carnegie Hall's website to learn more about the Link Up program. So thank you for your time today and for supporting Excellent in Tulsa's schools. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you. you had me at music and kids. Ron, thank you so much for sharing her with us today. I know it was a tight schedule for her coming in for the event, and we appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to ask Chuck Wilson to come up now, uh, the sharp dresser of the day, and he's going to introduce a new member to us. While they're coming up, John DeBar, thanks for doing the orientation. Yes, I'm proud to be wearing my sponsor pen today, by the way, and you too can have one of these sponsor pens. If you'll just see me, I'll tell you how that works. Alex Martinez is the new CEO of the Job Guide. And here is the Job Guide. It's an employment publication that has been in business since 1988 with coverage in Oklahoma, Missouri, and Arkansas. He is responsible for corporate strategy, business development, digital strategy, and government relations. Prior to this role, Alex was the CEO of Soltel Networks, an integrated media communications agency that specialized in developing and executing highly successful and innovative digital strategies for such notable companies as America's Carmark, Legacy Bank, and over 200 clients nationwide. In addition to helping clients increase their audience and revenues, Alex has advised various nonprofit organizations, policymakers, and legislators on their digital initiatives. He led Sotel Networks for 15 years. Alex has held various leadership positions in the region's community-based organizations, including past president of the Regional Chamber of Commerce for Southwest Missouri and Northwest Arkansas, past co-chairman of the Multicultural Committee for the Rogers Lowell, Air Lowell Area Chamber of Commerce. He currently is involved with numerous organizations, including Tulsa Area Human Resource Association, Tulsa Regional Chamber of Commerce, Greater Bentonville Chamber of Commerce, and the Arkansas Economic Development Commission. In 2008, Alex was nominated for Hispanic Magazine's Entrepreneur of the Year Award. He currently splits living between downtown Tulsa and Bentonville. On his downtime, Alex enjoys spending time with his wife, Sonny, and boys, Ethan and Jude, technology, gadgets, cooking, and playing golf, as his oldest son is on the golf team at his high school. Now, little known fact about Alex. I love these little known facts. He is a huge, huge WrestleMania fan. <laughs> he attends live events and even streams weekly episodes. And be watching for your invitation for his annual WrestleMania party, now that he's a member of Rotary. <laughs> so while we are welcoming Alex, I would like to ask his wife, Sonny, who's here with him today, to please stand so we can welcome both of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuck and Alex. Uh, Alex, we need to talk. I've got a son that's a big fan that's wearing me out, David Wagner, to get a fighter here for our open meeting in May. So we may have a trifecta going on here. <laughs> uh, I have a couple of announcements today. Rotarian, uh, we've had a couple of Rotarians affected by loss this week. Uh, condolences to Luann Bullinger for the loss of her father from Eureka Springs, Arkansas on March the 23rd. And condolences as well to Jerry Stamper on the passing of his mother yesterday. Cards are on your tables for extended sympathy to Luann and Jerry. Please give a, their thoughts and prayers. Okay, 
I was a little premature, wasn't I? A little bit, Catherine, but go for it. Sorry. Uh, first, is Forrest Cameron here today? I've been searching the audience, and I don't see him. Okay. Well, then I don't have any slides, because I'm not going to show slides without Forrest being here. So I'm going to make another announcement. Okay. And my announcement is that next week I'm going to have a slide for my assistant, uh, Mr. Bob Lenacher, for his birthday. But he's here today. But I want you to know that Bob is now official, because when he arrived today, the office had put a new sign at his table. Bob, you want to hold your sign up? It says Sarge's assistant, and it has his name. <laughs> so isn't that awesome? So yay. He, he's official now. So, so a pre-happy birthday. We'll have a slide for him. He might be here, maybe not. Um, but his birthday's on April 8th, and then we're going to hold those slides for next week because Forrest does so much. He needs to be here for his slides, okay? All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And Bob, 60 years old? 65? He's a big 9 0 on April the 8th. Congratulations, Bob. We have a couple of committee meetings today. Budget Committee is going to meet in room 234, and Rotary Youth Exchange is going to meet in room 233. It's now my pleasure to introduce our Rotarian of the Day, Sydney Marcellus. Sydney is an account executive for Cox Business, where she focuses on bringing the best communication solutions to local area businesses, specializing in small businesses. Uh, before working for Cox Communications, she worked at Roderick Polson Tax Resolution and Accounting Firm as her business development coordinator. That's where she became... Uh, acquainted with our speaker, and she is very excited to be able to introduce her today. In her spare time, Sydney has spearheaded the Yearling Class 3 service project, is involved in the 35 and Under Committee, volunteers at the Tulsa Food Bank, and is beginning her own network marketing business. What do you do in your spare time? Get married. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> she is engaged to Teddy Andrus, the guy with the sharp socks over there, and they plan to wed in October. I was not going to say the fun fact by Sydney, but our new member just busted it out. I didn't know you couldn't do this, but Sydney can lick her elbow. So help me welcome our Rotarian of the Day, Sydney. Thank you, President John. So everybody's doing it. I know, that always happens. Whenever I say that, there's always a, a small cluster of people that try it, and you can't do it, and I'm one of the few people that can, so I'll show you guys later. Um, <laughs> it is such an honor to introduce Rachel Pappy to all of you today. Rachel began working in the accounting field in 1999. She earned her Juris Doctorate at Oklahoma City University and began practicing tax law. She is now the partner and vice president at Polston Tax, where she oversees 85 employees at five offices in two states. So she has a lot of people under her that she takes care of. She is featured on Fox 25, giving monthly tax updates and news. She is the best-selling author, has been awarded Super Lawyer, Rising Star, Next 40 Under 40, was nominated as Most Outstanding Lawyer of the Year, and was selected by the IRS to provide a nine-part seminar on behalf of the IRS. She is a mother of three children and gives back to the community through her Rod Polston Servant Heart Foundation. She enjoys sharing her knowledge with business professionals like yourselves. Please help me give a warm rotary welcome to Rachel Pappy. I'm not as tall as Sydney, I have to move that down. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna, I am an attorney, which means I make money by talking a lot. So I'm gonna keep my watch right here and uh, keep track of the time so everyone can get out of here on time. Uh, I prepared some slides today about um, just ta tax season and uh, my clients are primarily business owners are self-employed, and I know I've spoken to a couple of rotaries, and I know that there's a lot of self-employed individuals and business owners, so I thought this would be an appropriate time to talk about some of the cases I've seen before the IRS that might be able to provide you with some helpful tips on what to watch out for with the IRS through some 
real experiences of others in Oklahoma. Um, like Sydney said, I was an accountant before I became an attorney, and it's easy for me to be a, be a defense counsel to people fighting uh, as I fight the IRS, and people hate the IRS, but I'll say up front, the IRS, unfortunately, has a difficult job to do, and that is they're put in the responsibility of collecting taxes for the government, and they do that as efficiently as they see possible, but oftentimes that's at the detriment to business owners and self-employed individuals when they shut down businesses so that your customers will go to someone who is paying their taxes and they seize assets and levy bank accounts. Um, it's not because the IRS, and I say this not to defend the IRS, it's not because they're heartless, although it may feel that way. It's because they're trying to be efficient with their time and resources, and they don't have a lot. I, you know, because we fight the IRS so much, we've built some great relationships over there, and so I hear their stories about office supply day, and when the office supplies arrive, everybody scoops them up as fast as vultures, and they're gone in, within a minute because there aren't notepads and pens to go around. And those are the true stories I hear from Oklahoma City and Tulsa and Muskogee and Lawton Revenue Officers, which is sad to me because that's one of the most important jobs of our government is to collect taxes so we can progress as a society. And if they don't even have the notepads to do their job, they're in a tough spot. So I sympathize, but more importantly, my clients are the business owners and self-employed. And so I do not appreciate the intimidation tactics that business owners and self-employed individuals have to put up with from the IRS because they're, la they're lacking the resources they need to do their jobs appropriately. I'm going to describe some cases uh, to sort of bring the law to life, but this is a cartoon I found. Dear IRS, I'd like to cancel my subscription. Please remove my name from your mailing list. <laughs> now, if you have ever had any encounter with the IRS, that you would, you'll know they not only send you one letter, they send you two. And if you own a business and you, let's say, there's some kind of confusion over a payroll, one quarter of a payroll, or two quarters, or three quarters, or four quarters, Two letters per quarter means you're going to get eight letters for that one year. And God forbid you have another business owner, you're going to get 16 letters. If you have four owners, you're going to get 32 letters all about the same thing. Likewise, if you're married filing joint, you're going to get four letters to your house about one tax year telling you, reminder, we are looking for whatever. And the next month, you're going to get another letter saying, reminder, we're waiting on this. So the IRS... Uh, keeps the tree industry or <laughs> lumber industry in business in chopping down all those trees and sending out these letters. I say this because we have an entire you know, department dedicated to the mail. We have, what, maybe 5,000 clients right now, and we get a truckload of mail every day for those clients just with notices that really have, um, I'm not going to say no purpose, but we often have to tell our clients, don't worry about that letter. That's part of the IRS's process. The letters you do have to watch out for if you get a letter from the IRS is if you get something that comes certified. And that is important, and it is important that your address with the IRS be correct. The IRS's process in moving a case forward is by sending a letter. They don't actually have to notify you. And in sending that letter, they don't have to send it to your actual address. They have to send it to your address of record. So if they send something certified to your address of record, which was on your last filed tax return, and it comes back undeliverable to the IRS, it doesn't matter. The IRS has done their diligence in sending it to the last address of record. Even though it, was, it went certified, they know that you did not receive it. They're able to move forward in collections. And collections means seizing assets or taking whatever actions um, they choose to at that juncture. So that's an important point I want to make. Your address of record, you can call them. However, the better way to make sure your address is correct is by filing your tax returns. And I know that sounds simple, and some of the things I'm going to talk about today is what do you do if you can't uh, pay those? I'll, I'll talk about that at the end if I have time. Uh, but don't not file. So I know that was a double negative, but I stress that because too many of our clients, for whatever reason, you know, this right now we're seeing a lot of in individuals in oil and gas. Oil and gas price dropped, so whatever reserve individuals may have had in 2014, they lived on that in 2015, and when the 15 return came due, they just didn't file it because they didn't have the money to pay the taxes that were due on whatever income they had. And so they didn't file 15. Well, now 16's due, and they're coming to our office saying, I didn't file 15. What should I do now? Should I not file 16? So, and that's, you know, 
I, I'll say this, I was an accountant before I became an attorney, and I, and I had said that before, but in my role as an accountant, I had been preparing tax returns for my clients. I kid you not, it had never occurred to me that a client would not file their tax return. I thought, everybody's going to get their tax return, file it, and send in the check with it. And it's not your responsibility as the accountant at that juncture to file it for the client and send it in. Not until I became an attorney did I realize clients can hold, have all of their tax returns for 20 years and not file them. Just keep them in their closet. And if the IRS shows up, they'll file them all at once. Or I don't know. And I say that because we have a number of clients, and I say number, thousands of clients who haven't filed ever, haven't filed in 10 years. I met with a client who hasn't filed since he became a realtor in the 80s. And he wanted to know what he has to do to get compliant now. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you what's most interesting about that. He only came to our office now. He, hasn't, he became a realtor in the 80s, and he only came to our office yesterday. No, actually, it was two days ago. He came to our office on Monday at 2 o'clock. I met with him because the Oklahoma Tax Commission suspended his real estate license because they realized he hadn't filed a tax return. And so it took them since the 80s to realize he has not filed a tax return. If, if you own a business and you have any kind of business tax liability, own a business, you have any kind of tax liability, you are required to have a revenue officer assigned to your case. A revenue officer is somebody local, so that's going to be someone out of the Tulsa office. I will let you in on a little secret that's in the tax industry, and that is if you have a Tulsa revenue officer, you're going to lose some years on your life. and from, you know, your, your representative is also going to lose some years of their life in terms of the headache that the Tulsa Revenue Officers will cause everybody involved. The Tulsa Revenue Officers are described, and I'm not saying this to joke or to scare anyone, the Tulsa Revenue Officers are described by taxpayer advocate as rogue, rogue IRS officers. They're, and I'll give you a couple examples off the top of my head. We had a revenue officer who we went in a, I went in a trust fund interview with my client. Trust fund interview is a basic uh, form of questions you have to ask about who's responsible for the business. We walk in, and the Tulsa Revenue Officer, Stephen Schrader, asks my client, does your girlfriend know that that other blonde slept over last night? That was the first question out of his mouth. And I objected and took my client out of the room because Obviously, that was an attempt by the revenue officer to intimidate my client and, and, and psychologically mess with him. It has nothing to do with the taxes that my client owed. We appealed that to um, Taxpayer Inspector General of Tax Administration, which is called TIGDA, which is the, for, the, ap, the uh, avenue that you get to appeal these types of things to. And they upheld it. They said it's valid, it's valid for the revenue officer to sit outside that taxpayer's house to determine any third-party contact, any um, third-party individuals that the IRS may have interest in, and it was the IRS's, it was valid for the IRS to ask about the individuals that they see. They, so they upheld it. Even, well, and, okay, so there's that one. <laughs> we had another revenue officer, Tulsa revenue officer, who went up and down one of our clients on his street in his neighborhood, went up and down the street, knocked on all the doors of all the neighbors and said, hi, I'm revenue officer so-and-so. I'm here in regards to your neighbor, uh, let's say John Rains. I'm here in regards to your neighbor, John Rains. I can't tell you what I'm here in regards to, but how do you know John? So you can imagine how all of the neighbors of this individual street felt getting a, a visit from a revenue officer. It didn't matter that they didn't know what he was there for. And maybe John was innocent altogether, and the IRS was just trying to decide if they owed him money and a refund. <laughs> but uh, we appealed that, and the IRS upheld that as valid third-party contact. Tulsa Revenue Officer got cell phone records of, my client, of our client and called at random, called just at random, hi, this is so-and-so revenue officer, how do you know so-and-so, this taxpayer, and their business? And again, we appealed it, and the IRS upheld it under the same rule, it's valid third-party contact. And since that case on the cell phone records, well, revenue officers have, in Tulsa have all started using that. They've all started obtaining cell phone records, uh, not on all cases, but in a lot of cases where they feel like the taxpayer may be hiding something, and the IRS upholds that as valid third-party contact. Con contact, and the tax code is pretty broad in allowing that in as valid. 
So you'll have a local revenue officer who will do a full financial analysis, will do an asset viewing of all the assets of the business to determine, the purpose of the asset viewing is for the IRS to determine if should we shut down this business, what are these assets worth to us? Because the IRS is then responsible for seizing the assets and auctioning them. And that's important. If you do get a revenue officer, this asset viewing is an important opportunity to um, put the lowest price on all of your assets. So for example, a podium and a microphone, I might say these will both go for $5 together total at an IRS auction. And the reason I would say that is because, and the IRS would probably agree, the reason is you have to think of the likelihood that somebody at the IRS auction on the day in question is going to want a microphone and a podium. And they may buy it, maybe, for $5. So we've had entire restaurants valued at $5,000 for all the silverware and tables and chairs, and obviously the menus and the signs are all useless and, value and have no value. But the IRS is looking at that to say, not necessarily to shut down your business and seize the assets, because they'll shut down the business in other ways and make you deal with the assets. They want to know what the value of your assets are so you can borrow against it and pay it up front to the IRS. Typically, that'll be, especially if they recognize there's a, that there is equity in assets, they'll make you borrow against your equity to pay it up front to the IRS and then deal with that loan on the back end. And there's ways to get out of that, but that's the important thing of the asset viewing. The trust fund interview is the IRS's opportunity to ask questions about the business. And the important thing about the trust fund interview, and I, uh, I have overprepared, so if I don't get through all this material, which I don't anticipate I will, you can read uh, about some of these cases. Trust fund interview is important because the IRS determines who, ha who was an officer of the business with check writing and signing authority. The IRS uses that, officers of business with check signing authority, to determine how wide they can cast their net on the taxes that this business is responsible for. And what I mean by that is the IRS is going to try to bring everybody in that they can to be responsible for trust fund taxes. Trust fund taxes are when a business has payroll taxes due, which are filed on your form 941, payroll taxes are two parts. One is withheld from the employee, the withholding portion, and another portion people call the matching by the employer. It's not a true 50-50 match, but we'll go with that. So the IRS considers the matching portion the non-trust fund. Non-trust fund, that's the employer's responsibility. The part that's withheld by the, from the employee's paycheck or not remitted to the employee is what the IRS cal calls trust fund, and that means that the employer holds those funds in trust. It either belongs fully to the employee or it belongs to the IRS. The employer holds it in trust to be remitted to the IRS. Should those trust fund taxes, the withholding, not get sent to the IRS or the 941s not get filed and payments not made, the IRS looks at who the officers of the business are with check writing authority, and they hold them personally liable for the trust fund taxes. And what, what that means is that they will then make the assumption, make the connection that your personal assets were paid for by this employee's withholding. Your cars, your homes, your savings in your um, bank account, your 401k, the money that you have there is considered to be a direct association to those withholding funds that were not paid to the IRS. A def uh, sometimes we have clients who say, well, actually, I never had the money to send to the IRS. I get, wrote my client, I wrote my, my employee a net check. Maybe they made uh, they should have received a check for $100, but I wrote them an $80 check because 20 of it was taxes, and I only had 80 to start with. The IRS says it was either their money or the IRS's. It was never your money to not give them. So if you paid for an electric bill, your phone bill, anything, that $20 was in that money in those funds that were used, and so they hold you personally liable. This becomes very important because we see a lot of LLCs, for example, or entities set up where maybe a spouse, maybe uh, an officer with check writing authority at when the business was set up, maybe the business was set up and the, uh, let's say the husband set it up and he just made the wife a uh, vice president or a secretary in namesake on the entity documentation and just as a precautionary step had the wife be uh, have check writing authority on the bank account. The IRS, we had a case, uh, and actually it's in this, we had a case where the IRS, uh, we had a client who owned a taco business, and the wife was a full-time nurse, officer of the business with check signing authority, but she had nothing to do with the business. When the IRS recognized that this taco business was failing and was hundreds of thousand dollars behind in, on payroll taxes, they went to shut down the business, but more importantly, in the trust fund interview, they put that 
on the husband and the wife 100% jointly and individually for being officers of the business with check writing and signing authority. Even though the wife had no part and no, no part of the operations of this business and had never opened a letter from the IRS, the IRS said, as an officer of the business, you had a duty to the business. And even though, and they, even though you hadn't written checks, and actually they, she had written some checks during a short period of time when the husband was in the hospital and at his direction. She would take the checkbook to the hospital. He directed her on some of the bills, and she wrote checks, which after that was assessed against her, all the assets were in the wife's name. And this husband, maybe he did that because he knew of the, ta the tax problem or the pending, that there may be some pending problems, but all of their household assets were solely in the wife's name. House, cars, even on their personal bank account. He was an assigner on their personal bank account. And that's what made the IRS interested in the wife, who had nothing to do with this, because they couldn't attach themselves to anything. Of, he didn't have anything. So in that case, after the assessment was made, we appealed it and were able to find, and I urge you, if this were to happen to you, appeal it immediately. We were able to minimize the trust fund to just the quarter, the, one, the three months where the husband was in the hospital and the wife had signed checks. Now, I'm, I will tell you, actual, sign, sign, actual signing of checks is not required by the IRS. And that, it, it, it wasn't a quick appeal, and it went to several levels before that got approved, that it would be minimized to just that one quarter. But it was a major difference for them, because instead of hundreds of thousands of dollars, it was about $30,000 in payroll taxes, which they paid off, and the liens on all of their assets was freed. Um, levies and garnishments, uh, what, just what it sounds like, any customers that you work with, any accounts receivable outstanding, the IRS will issue levies. Uh, they'll contact your customers, and um, you'll have personal liabilities we talked about with the trust fund. Okay, here's a deal gone wrong. And this, I may actually just have time to maybe touch on this, and the next one is that taco case, so we may skip over that. Um, but this case was especially interesting and, and maybe helpful for somebody, anyone, someone here. This, our client had, um, while he was in high school, it, had started working for a car dealership. Started working for a car dealership selling cars. And that's all he had done his entire life. He, I'm not entirely sure if he finished high school, but um, he didn't go to college, and he later uh, opened his own car dealership selling used cars. So he had his own car dealership selling used cars and didn't pay payroll taxes. So this individual um, owed, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but several years, had several years of unfiled tax returns, and uh, all, I, I do know it was over 100,000, and I can't remember how much more over that. Now, the problem with this case in particular was that when the client came to us, he said, I want to continue selling cars. The IRS is coming to seize my assets. The revenue officer's already been assigned. He says he, wanna, he wants to seize all the cars, but I want this is the only thing I know how to do. At this juncture, I want to say he was in his 50s, and so he was now faced with, how do I start over? This is the only thing I know how to do, and I want to continue doing it. Do you have a solution to this? One thing I learned in this case, and the revenue officer apparently learned as well, is uh, car dealerships, I wasn't aware of how they worked. Now, this dealer specifically uh, was a car dealership for a specific manufacturer. And I learned through this case that those cars are on loan. They're not purchased by a lot of these car dealerships. And I don't know if anyone in here does the books or works with car dealerships, but in, on a lot of dealerships, they don't own the cars. They haven't purchased them. There, there are used car dealerships that actually purchase them at auction, but the vast majority that are, work directly with the manufacturer, they get them on loan. And how they get paid is a little bit from the sales price, but the majority is from these rebates and uh, other deals that they get from manufacturers. I learned it on this case, and so did the revenue officer, who had been frothing at the mouth about all these cars that were on the lot. And when we both realized there was no equity in all of these cars, and actually they didn't even belong to the client, they belonged to the car dealership, the revenue officer was pissed. Um, <laughs> so, my client had, uh, he was in his 50s, he failed to pay his payroll taxes. The problem we needed to solve was how to have him continue selling cars. Now, I'll tell you the solution we came up with is not one that I, that it, it was a solution we came up with, but even in telling you what it is, I, I didn't feel entirely comfortable as an attorney, and I'll explain why. The IRS cannot prevent you the liberty of 
being employed. You can do whatever you want. What he could not do is he could not shut down his LLC and reopen a new entity type of any form, C Corp, S Corp, LLC, any entity type with a new EIN and get new cars and get out of those old payroll taxes. The IRS, if you do that, the IRS calls the new entity a nominee, essentially a shell organization to evade your taxes. And what they will do is, even though this is a new entity with a new EIN, they attach all of the old taxes from the old business to the new entity. So that was what was gonna happen in this case. Should this individual open up a new business, any new business with any entity type, the IRS would just attach, it, he wouldn't get out of his taxes. And we had this also happen with an oil and gas company. The taxes would just get attached because the new company would be a nominee. The solution we had, and you can do this in any industry, is he, is he has the opportunity to have the liberty of selling cars as himself. And here's why I didn't feel entirely comfortable. We did tell him this solution. I didn't feel entirely comfortable because he would use his social security number to work as a DBA or a sole proprietor. Now, selling cars is a very dangerous business to be in. Something could happen, a number of things could happen with those cars. There's, you're opening yourself to a wide world of liability. And so the attorney side of me explained to him the liability caution in, not, in opening yourself up to that as a sole proprietor. And with that understanding and a consent that I <laughs> described in detail to him and had him sign, he opened up a new car dealership as a sole proprietor and the IRS wasn't able to do anything. And now that there's a statute of limitation on those taxes. And I'm, you know, I got asked earlier about uh, Rotorex and my interest in it. I'm closer to 40 than you may think. So this case, actually, the statute of limitations, I say that, statute of limitations on this case was, is 10 years. And 10 years passed since that case started. After 10 years, the statute of limitation ran. He's able to set up his entity type in a form that I feel more comfortable with, which provides him some liability protection. But should you ever, you know, realtor, or I had somebody in oil and gas, and that was another case I didn't feel comfortable. Oil and gas is also very dangerous. But the same thing happened in that case. He had a business entity. Uh, we shut it down. He was able to continue doing the exact same thing, but as a sole proprietor, because the IRS can't prevent you the liberty of gainful employment. This is the whole enchilada. I, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm going to finish here because it looks like I have about two minutes. This is a taco. Uh, the, my, Sydney gave me a beautiful biography. I'll add to that. My kitchen is pristine because I don't know how to cook. I also <laughs> apparently don't know what an enchilada is because I picked that picture myself. <laughs> That's a taco. Um, That's a taco. Yeah. So this is the client with the taco business. The title should be changed is really what it is because it was a taco business. Uh, and, and this is the case I touched on earlier with the wife having um, the wife's, all the assets were in her name and the IRS came against them. So we're not going to go over this one again. And I want to see if I can maybe touch on one more. I'll end with this. This is a case that really made me mad. And I'll try to speed it up so I can finish this and just give you uh, some of my perspective on the IRS. The client, this client owned a manufacturing business here in Oklahoma. They lost their biggest client and their profits instantly fell. And when I say biggest client, it was millions of dollars of revenue lost by, with this one client. So they stopped paying their payroll taxes as they attempted to build their business back up. The officers did not lay off any of their employees and developed a large personal tax liability as they kept pouring more and more money into the business to keep it alive. So this case in particular, so it's it, a large manufacturing business. They made parts almost as big as this room. As soon as I saw their parts, I knew the IRS couldn't seize them. So the IRS, not only could they not seize them, they couldn't do anything with it, even if should they seize it, should they take the expense of seizing these assets. The, um, this business is also the only business in a town in Oklahoma. And they employed basically this entire town, which is why they felt guilty about, they felt personal responsibility about laying off anybody, and they didn't. They didn't lay anyone off, even though they were in the red. Instead, they, father and son mortgaged everything that they personally owned to keep putting money into the business, which in my, from my perspective, I see, I, I feel that business owners are generous to their own detriment when their profits start to fall, because they care so much about all the other people they're responsible for, all their employees and support staff. They, start, stop thinking about their business and start thinking about everyone else to their detriment because that's usually why I see 
they've stopped paying their taxes, but they're trying to keep this business afloat. But as you're paying payroll to these people, you're owing more in payroll taxes. So it's cyclic and getting worse. The IRS wanted to shut down this business. And I only share this case. Not, this one doesn't necessarily give you tips, but it will give, tell you what to expect with the IRS. This client, they owed about $2 million in taxes, business taxes. And they knew that, that they had a competitor on the other side of the country that would buy these parts, their goodwill, their customer lists, everything. And so they reached out to their competitor, told them they had a tax liability. We had already explained to this client that they were going to get an offer and compromise settlement approved, maybe for $1,000 because they had no equity left in anything. This client felt like they wanted to give the IRS something more. So they reached out to this competitor. Competitor was interested in buying the assets because they were going to get a steal on everything. And they would pay a million dollars. Now, how IRS liens work is if you have assets that the IRS has filed liens on, the IRS gets 100% of the proceeds that would go to the taxpayers. So in this case, the IRS would get about a million dollars on a $2 million liability. And the revenue officer assigned to the case also understands these clients have nothing in their name and nothing of value anymore. The, cut, the competitor just wanted a letter from the IRS saying that these liens and tax liability would not attach to them if they purchased all of this, customer lists, goodwill, and the assets. Valid, valid request. So I wrote a great letter with the tax code and the law and case precedent, and the competitor said, thanks for your letter. We want it from the IRS, which I was fine with that. And I understood. <laughs> not insulted at all. Um, the... I went, called the revenue officer and I told him what they wanted. And he said, I'm not writing that letter. I'm not required to, which was ridiculous. And so I called his manager. The Tulsa manager should be fired if you haven't worked with her before. She felt that he shouldn't write the letter either. We work with her all the time, so I feel very comfortable and confident saying that. Uh, <laughs> Then we uh, called her manager, who was an uh, acting manager, a transition manager, because her manager had actually been, uh, the Tulsa revenue manager had been moved to another department. Called that manager, and she said, he doesn't have to write the letter. This is a true story. I then called that person's manager, who's in uh, t Texas, and I, and I explained the situation, and he said, he doesn't have to write the letter. So now I'm dealing with four idiot IRS agents who don't want a million dollars that we're, hand we're essentially handing to them. They don't have to do anything. They can't seize these assets. These clients are going to get a $1,000 settlement, and the taxpayers are going to get out of $2 million. I know the end. And in that case, and you know, the, my biggest strength and biggest fault in this case was a good example, is how angry I get over the right thing being done. I mean, the right thing needs to be done. I feel, you know, and I say this all the time, everyone should pay their fair share of taxes, but when they're in a situation that they're, they don't have that money, you should use the law to get the right thing done. Use the law, just use the law. And in this case, we had an opportunity within the law with one simple letter to get the IRS a million dollars that I was the one fighting for to get done, of all people. And I drove to the Tulsa IRS, I drove um, to the Tulsa IRS office to surprise the revenue officer and try to figure out what his reasoning was. And in the meantime, I called the last manager who's in Washington, D.C. And I will tell you his name. His name is um, Art Gandera. And Art Gandera in Washington, D.C., as I'm driving to the office, said, yes, he should write the letter. Of course he should write the letter. And I get to the Tulsa office. I say, you know, I'm here for so-and-so. He doesn't know I'm coming. And luckily, he does agree to see me. And I, you know, said, what's your reasoning on this case? I just, I need the letter. And I just talked to Art Gandera in D.C. And he said, you should write the letter. And I kid you not, he said, then have Art write the letter. So I'm sitting there with my notepad and... I am just dumbfounded, and I said, okay, I'm writing his name, the revenue officer's name down, and I said, revenue officer so-and-so will not write a letter for such-and-such -such case to accept a million dollars from such-and-such -such company. And then I said, can you just tell me your reasoning so I can write it down here? And these are his exact words, and they will be seared in my mind forever because he said, I don't know. I don't know. So I wrote down, I don't know, and then I turned around my notepad, and I said, can you just sign that. <laughs> and this is why I'll end on this true story. I have a little bit of video because this is a cell phone age and you pull out videos when things like this happen. He called security who grabbed both of my arms and took me out of the IRS building because I asked him to sign the I don't know explanation. 
But I did take a little video that I never posted on YouTube because I'm a respectable attorney. But <laughs> uh, that really happened. So that really happened. And the client, sure enough, you know, that stuff is off the turnpike. If you've ever seen a bunch of crap that you're like, what has that stuff been sitting out there for years? It's because no one can do anything with it. It employed this entire town and now it's just rotting in a field and nobody can use it except somebody in the other side of the country and I'm not gonna say where. And uh, that, those two clients, father and son, got settlements for $1,000 because at that time there was a $1,000 minimum and the IRS lost, they at least lost a million dollars if not two million. And statute of limitations are done. Thank you. I'll be here for questions if you have any, and I'm not going to hold it, take any more time. Thanks. I know we record our meetings, so it'd be great if you could hit the pause button, because I took more notes on this meeting than any other meeting. <laughs> if I haven't filed my taxes since the 80s, I would leave the country. My wife cannot watch the recording of this because she signs for all three of my LLCs. <laughs> Christina and I are going to immediately go back to the office and revoke our signature cards. <laughs> and my neighbors would not be the slightest curious if they were interviewed by a compliance officer. <laughs> That's just standard business around my place. We have a thank you book that we have asked you to sign that we give to Celia Clinton, our adopted school. It is called, <laughs> I love the IRS. So we have a slide that uh, recognizes all of our volunteers from today. Please help me give them a big round of applause. And Sydney, thank you for bringing our speaker today. We have three quick announcements. Linda Bradshaw, if you'll come up first to talk to us about Fireside. Thanks, uh, President John. Just want to remind everybody that Firesides uh, will be April the 17th to the 21st, and I want to thank all of you who volunteered to host a Fireside for this Rotary Club this year. On your tables are the hosts for this year, and I want you to take a look at it. I hope you already have. Uh, decide, uh, sign your name, pick your fireside, and um, be sure to participate. And we've arranged it to where you can't not find a time to go. We have morning, noon, mid-noon, evening, late evening. So please pick um, a host and do sign up. We uh, sign up this week and next week, and you can also sign up online. So thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. And firesides are a hoot. Is Daniel Branson in the house? I mean, Brunson. Daniel? Okay. He had a wine and cheese uh, announcement, so see them out in the lobby. If they're still out there, they're here before every meeting. That's a great event. It's coming up April the 20th, so if you can go support them, it's wonderful. Uh, Luann Gillinger. We have prizes. Woohoo! Very good. Thank you, everyone, for following the IBA Awards on our new social media accounts. Uh, we had a couple of contests this year, or uh, this last week, and the reason we did it, if you'll go to the slides, um, go to the next one, and to the next one, is that uh, we're finding that people who share our social media posts with their friends uh, we'll get a lot more followers and a lot more information out to these people. In fact, I shared it with about 100 of my friends and 60 of them followed wow. uh, the IBA Award accounts. Oh, my able model here. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. All right, so, so far in a week and a half, we've gotten 24,300 impressions with 916 post engagements. And what that means is they either click like, they share, they follow or they get more information. Okay, next slide. All right, so if you followed the IBA Awards, uh, we have five prizes. And the grand prize winner, if you hear your name, please come up and get your award from Jean Martin, co-chair of the event. Uh, it's uh, access for two to the IBA Celebrity Reception. 
And what I did is I pulled everybody who participated, even including non-Rotarians, put your name in a big old bucket and pulled your name out. So this is totally random. And the winner is Tom Clenda. Hey, Tom. <laughs> oh, present to win, right? <laughs> we'll catch Tom later. Oh, he's here? Oh. Wow, you're so quiet. I'd have been jumping up and down and running up to get my two okay. tickets. And DJ Morrow Ingram won a Hard Rock hoodie. Cool. <laughs> we also have Becky Fields won a Hard Rock hoodie. All right. <laughs> And we have, oh, Tiffany Eddorf won a Hard Rock hoodie. All right. And then we have uh, a winner, Tim Colwell won the Yeti. Oh. Is he here today? He's not here. Okay, here we go. Able model. All right, so now uh, this last week we had uh, a trivia contest uh, to let people uh, tell us which uh, Heisman Trophy winners we posted on our Facebook pages, and we got about 10 or 12 responses, and the winner at random is John Raines. Ooh. <laughs> okay, is that because so I gave you both names? <laughs> yeah, you did. I went in twice, right? Next slide, please. All right, so we're going to have a contest this next week. If you post anything about the IBO Awards and give us our hashtag, it's hashtag IBO Awards 2017, we're going to have a drawing for um, a bracelet from, what's the name of it? Rustic Cuff. Rustic Cuff, thank you. <laughs> from, Name blank from Rustic Cuff, and then we've got uh, some more hard rock shirts. So, thank you. Please follow us. All right, thank you very much for your efforts. <laughs> Let's draw quickly, Miss Sarge. Okay, we will draw quickly. Six of Clubs is on the bottom. Let's firm that up. So particular. Okay, first of all, I want to say this money is the pot that we divide um, between the winner of the drawing, if they get the Joker, and Rotary International. And the pot today is $4,473. And I just want to say that John Raines is like the luckiest guy ever. I didn't buy tickets today. You didn't buy tickets. Okay, so our winner is number 9556271. Two oh, seven one. We have somebody standing up, lucky like one. S nope, he's leaving. S okay, six two seven one. Everybody check their tickets. All right, we have to do it again. Well, that was close. So there's a guy after my own heart. He doesn't check his tickets because he never wins. Assume he's not, and he thinks, oh, crap, i got to get him out and look. Cause no there you go. Well, congratulations. Let's draw a card. All right, so we're just, like, doing the mix-up. So there, we have 20 cards left, for those of you who are wondering how many cards are left. But this could be it. Ooh. Oh. And we get to play again next week, so bring your dollars. All right. It's heating up Good now, job, guys. Guy. Good job. Okay, hey, real quick. You. Thank you for playing. I have a segment I'm going to call Why I Wear My Pen. So uh, I have had several of these incidences, but last week encouraged me to tell this story. I was wearing my pen, my rotary pen, and I was at Chick-fil-A, and there was a gentleman sitting there by himself at a table and I had compassion on him. He was an older gentleman and I gave him a big smile while I was getting my uh, soda and he smiled back and looked at me sharply and so I went back to my table and set some stuff down and went and got my wife's silverware. Yes, I am a gentleman and gave him another big smile and he gave me another big smile back and pretty soon he's leaning over my shoulder. He walked across with his cane and leaned over my shoulder and he says, 
I reckon the way that you looked at me, you're wanting to give me that nice tie. And I said, well, sir, it's actually the first time I've worn it, so I'd like to kind of hang on to it. And he laughed, and he scurried on and went and sat down. No more than five minutes later, I spilled barbecue sauce from here to here on my tie. So I go into Chick-fil-A to clean it off, and it's one of those motion things. So I'm going like this, and I'm trying to clean and tie it. won't run water, and I finally get it kind of half clean, and I'm coming out, and he sees me and gives me a big smile, and I walk over there, and I said, I might can make you a deal on this tie now. He said, well, give it to me, and I'll clean it for you. And I said, yeah, I've heard that before. He said, what's that pin on your shoulder? And I said, well, I'm a member of the Rotary Club of Tulsa downtown. He said, oh, my goodness. He said, I served the Rotary Club of Tulsa in 1962 at the Mayo Hotel. Were you a member then? <laughs> so that's my pen story for today. Go out and tell people about Rotary and have a great time. Thank you.